and then with heads bowed, let us be united in one heart and voice in the prayer of our Lord as we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading for today comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew. Um, it seems like in most Sunday school curriculum um, and most every Jesus movie that has ever been made, somehow, some way, this parable uh, is talked about. And uh, I suspect you will find it quite familiar. So reading at Matthew 25, verses 31 through 40, we find these words. When the Son of the Most High comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. And all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. And then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by the Lord of hosts, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you as a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these, you did it to me. And may God bless to our hearing and our understanding these words from our scripture for today. And would you pray with me? Most loving and most gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. You know the story of the three wise men of the East and how they traveled from far away to offer their gifts at the manger cradle in Bethlehem. But have you ever heard the story of the other wise men who also saw the star in its rising and set out to follow it, and yet did not arrive with his brethren in the presence of the young child Jesus. Of the great desire of this fourth pilgrim, and how it was denied yet accomplished in the denial. Of his many wanderings and the probations of his soul, of the long way of his seeking, and the strange way of his finding the one whom he sought. You know the names of Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. But what about this other wise man, Artaban? Artaban speaks to the council of priests. It has been shown to me and to my three companions among the Magi, Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. We have searched the ancient tablets of Chaldea, and computed the time. It falls in this year. We have studied the sky, and we saw two of the greatest stars draw near together in the sign of the fish, which is the house of the Hebrews. We also saw a new star there, which shone for one night and then vanished. Now again, the great planets are meeting. This night is their conjunction my three brothers are watching at the ancient temple of the seven spheres, and I am watching here. 
If the star shines again, they will wait ten days for me at the temple, and then we will set out together for Judea to see and worship the promised one who shall be born king of Israel. I believe the sign will come. I have made ready for the journey. I have sold my house and my possessions and bought these three jewels, a sapphire, a ruby, and a pearl, to carry them as tribute to the king. The shiver that thrills through the earth ere she rouses from her night's sleep had begun. And the cool wind that heralds the daybreak was drawing downward from the lofty, snow-traced ravines of Mount Orontes. Far over the eastern plain, a white mist stretched like a lake, but the sky toward the western horizon was clear. Jupiter and Saturn rolled together like drops of brilliant flame about to blend into one. As Artaban watched that, an azure spark was born out of the darkness beneath, rounding itself with purple splendors to a crimson sphere, and spiring upward through rays of saffron and orange into a point of white radiance, tiny and infinitely remote, yet perfect in every part, and it pulsated in the enormous vault, as if the three jewels safely tucked within the folds of his robe had mingled and been transformed into a, a living heart of light. He bowed his head. He covered his brow with his hands. It is the sign, he said. The king is coming, and I will go to meet him. Before the birds had fully roused to their joyful chant of morning song, before the mist had begun to lift lazily from the plain, the other wise man was in the saddle, riding swiftly along the high road which skirted the base of Mount Orontes, westward. Artaban must indeed ride wisely and well if he would keep the appointed hour with the other magi. On the tenth day of his journey, still three hours from the temple of the seven spheres where his comrades awaited his arrival, Artaban came upon a grove of date palms. The grove was close and silent as a tomb. Not a leaf rustled, not a, not a bird sang. Then in the, the shadow of the last date palm, he saw a dark object. He dismounted and the dim starlight revealed the form of a man lying across the road. His pallid skin, dry and yellow as parchment, bore the mark of the deadly fever which ravaged the marshlands in autumn. Artaban turned away the thought of pity, consigning the body to a funeral of the desert. But as he turned, a long, faint, ghostly sigh came from the man's lips, and his brown, bony fingers grasped the hem of Artaban's robe and held him fast. How could he stay here in the darkness and minister to a dying stranger? If he lingered for but an hour, he would barely reach his destination by the appointed time. His companions would think he had given up the journey. They would go without him. He would lose his quest. If he went on now, the man would surely die. But if he stayed, he might be restored. Should he turn aside, if only for a moment, from the following of the star to give a cup of cold water to a poor, perishing Hebrew? God of truth and purity, he prayed, direct me in the holy path, the way of wisdom which you alone know. He knew what he must do. He carried the man to a little mound at the foot of a palm tree. He brought water from one of the small canals, canals nearby and moistened the sufferer's brow and mouth. He mingled a draft of a simple but potent remedy he carried with him and poured it slowly between the man's colorless lips. For hours he labored as, as only a skillful healer can do. 
And at last the man's strength began to return. And when it had, he sat up and said, May the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob bless and prosper the journey of the merciful and bring him in peace to his desired haven, because you have taken pity upon the sick. It was already past midnight. Artaban rode in haste, but the first beams of the sun already shone in the eastern sky as he approached the Temple of the Seven Spheres, anxiously scanning for a glimpse of his friends. But there was no trace of at the edge of the temple terrace, he, he saw a mound of broken bricks and under them a piece of parchment. He nervously took hold of it and read, We have waited past the midnight hour and can delay no longer. We go to find the king. Follow us, if you will, across the desert. Artaban sat down upon the ground and covered his head in despair. How can I cross the desert with no food and a spent horse? I must return to Babylon, sell my sapphire, and buy a train of camels and provisions for the journey. I may never overtake my friends. Only God the merciful knows whether I shall not lose the sight of the king, because I tarry to show mercy. So having secured provisions and camels for his trek across the desert, Artaban renewed his journey. Arid and inhospitable mountain ranges rose before him. By day the fierce heat pressed its intolerable burden on the quivering air, and by night the jackals prowled and barked in the distance, while a bitter, chilling cold followed the fever of the day. But through the heat and cold, Artaban moved steadily onward until he finally arrived at Bethlehem. It was the third day after the other three wise men had come to that place and had found Mary and Joseph with the young child Jesus and laid their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh at his feet. Then the other wise man drew near, weary but, but full of hope, bearing his ruby and his pearl to offer to the king. From the open door of a low stone cottage, he heard the sound of a woman's voice singing softly. He entered and found a young mother hushing her baby to rest. She told him of the strangers from the east who had appeared in the village three days ago. But the travelers disappeared as suddenly as they had come. And the couple from Nazareth with their child, whom they sought, also apparently secretly departed that same night. It was whispered they were going far away to Egypt. Artaban listened to the young mother's gentle, timid speech. And the child in her arms looked up in his face and smiled. Might not this child? have been the promised prince, he asked with himself as he touched the child's soft cheek. Kings have been born in lowlier houses than this, and the favor of the star might rise even from such a cottage. But it did not seem the God of wisdom had chosen to reward his search so soon and so easily. The one whom he sought had gone before him, he must follow the king to Egypt. And then suddenly there came the noise of a, of a wild confusion and uproar in the streets of the village, a, a shrieking and wailing of women's voices, a, a clang of swords and a desperate cry, the soldiers of Herod, they are killing our children. Artaban went quickly and stood in the doorway of the house. The soldiers came hurrying down the street with bloody hands and dripping swords. And at the sight of the stranger in his imposing dress, they, they hesitated with surprise. And the captain of the band approached the threshold to thrust him aside, but Artaban did not stir. He held the soldier silently in his gaze for an instant and then said in a low voice, 
There is no one in this place but me. And I am waiting to give this jewel to the prudent captain who will leave me in peace. He showed him the ruby glistening in the hollow of his hand. The captain was amazed at the splendor of the gem. The pupils of his eyes expanded with desire and the hard lines of greed wrinkled around his lips. He stretched out his hand and grabbed the ruby, crying out to his men, March on! There's no child here. Artaban re-entered the cottage, turned his face to the east and prayed, God of truth, forgive me. I have said the thing that is not to save the life of a child. And now I have lost two of my gifts. Shall I ever be worthy to see the face of the king? But the voice of the woman, weeping for joy in the shadows behind him, said very gently, Because you have saved the life of my little one, may the Lord bless you. But would God concur with the feelings of this young mother? Artaban wondered. Years passed, and Artaban's quest for finding the king took him to Egypt, seeking everywhere for the family that had traveled there from Bethlehem. He, and he sought out the counsel of a venerable rabbi in Alexandria who said, Remember, my son, the king whom you are seeking is not to be found in a palace, nor among the rich and powerful. The light for which the world awaits is a new light, whose glory shall rise out of patient and triumphant suffering. And the kingdom which is to be established forever is a new kingdom, the royalty of perfect and unconquerable love. I do not know how this shall come to pass, nor how the turbulent Kings and peoples of earth shall be brought to acknowledge the Messiah and pay homage to him. But this I know. Those who seek him will do well to look among the poor and the lowly, the sorrowful and the oppressed. And so Artaban's quest continued. Traveling from place to place, searching among the people of the dispersion, with whom the little family from Bethlehem might perhaps have found a refuge. He passed through countries where famine lay heavy upon the land, and the poor were crying for bread. He made his dwelling in, in plague-stricken cities where the sick languished in the bitter companionship of helpless misery. In all this populous and intricate world of anguish, he found none to worship, but he found many to help. He fed the hungry and clothed the naked, healed the sick and comforted the captive. And, it, and his years went by more swiftly than the weaver's shuttle that flashes back and forth through the loom while the web grows and the invisible pattern is completed. It seemed almost as if he had forgotten his quest. Three and thirty years the life of Artaban had passed in his search. And he was still a pilgrim and a seeker after the light. His hair, once dark, was now white as snow. His eyes, that once flashed like flames of fire, were dull as embers smoldering among the ashes, worn and weary and ready to die. But still looking for the king, he had come for what may well be the last time, he thought, to Jerusalem. He had often visited the holy city before and searched through all the lanes and crowded halls without finding any trace of the family who had fled from Bethlehem so long ago. But, but, but now it seemed as if he must make one more effort and something whispered in his heart at last, he might succeed. It was the season of Passover. The city was thronged with strangers. The children of Israel, scattered in far lands all over the world, had returned to the temple for the great feast. 
But on this day, there was a sense of agitation among the multitude. The sky was veiled with a portentous gloom, and, and currents of excitement seemed to flash through the crowd like the thrill which shakes the forest on, on the eve of a storm. Ardavan joined company with a group of people from his own country, Parthian Jews, who had come up to keep the Passover, and inquired of them the, the cause of the unrest he sensed among the crowds, and where they were all going. They said they were going to watch the execution of someone named Jesus of Nazareth, a man who had done many wonderful works among the people, so that they loved him greatly. But the priests and elders had said he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. And Pilate had sent him to the cross because he said he was the king of the Jews. 